Mrs. Roy Lilly. Well, what do the results of the local elections tell us? There won't be a general election anytime soon. Labour winning the next general is not a slam dunk. And governments in trouble always hang on for as long as they can. Charmer will need a bigger swing than Blair to form the next government, and he's put his foot in it. During a radio interview, he dodged calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. And the sophologists point out that pulled the plug on a huge number of Muslim votes. Many a slip, twixt cup and lip, as your granny would tell you. <laughs> the majority of the public, look, is well fed up with politicians. There's no great flocking to Labour because of the quality of their plans, policies or charisma. It's more fleeing from a knackered Tory party, as the electoral gains by the minor parties will tell you. Well, what do the technocrats tell us? Well, all of them, and I, I linked to quite a, uh, an interesting little article on aggregating the, um, the polling and public opinion, all of them list the economy and the NHS top of the nation's concerns. Local government and their elections have no purview over either. Indeed, they're victims of both. Economic performance is a principal indicator for local government funding or the lack of it. And social care or the lack of it is a huge contributor to the woes of the NHS. The upshot, these election results may not tell us as much as we think. Labour have no cohesive answer to fix waiting lists other than stopping a tax dodge that will take a full cycle of the economy to have any impact in the hope the proceeds will fund overtime for NHS staff to do more. Well, that's not a plan, it's a colander. The Tories, well, they don't need a plan. All the time junior doctors keep striking, Sunak has the perfect excuse for not bringing down the lists. No one has a plan to end the strikes and the junior doctors won't talk unless there's a 35% uplift on the table and I and I linked to a Guardian article it's, a, it's about a month old now but it's worth a, l a look about the strikes so mark my words the temptation will be for some numpty to claim an NHS reorganisation will solve the problem it's always a bad idea most reorganisations fail the WIFIM test <laughs> the WIFIM What's in it for me with him? Transfer care from secondary to primary care? Well, what's in it for the trusts? Nothing, so they'll make sure it won't work. And if you do it the other way around, you've got the same answer. Then there's the morale thing and the distraction thing. In a system as complex as the NHS, generic solutions never work. The issue for the NHS is capacity. And reorganisation doesn't create capacity. Only cash and time can do that. But bet the farm, following a political change, comes the inevitable reorganisation. Politicians, oblivious to history, repeat it. Changing how the NHS is organised makes no difference to what happens in the surgery or clinic. What makes a difference is more surgeries and more clinics. We know reducing waiting is the number one demand from the public. Reducing waiting lists needs time focus and total list management. Relentless revalidation. Symptoms resolve. Care elsewhere. Find out. Investigate every did not attend. Do you know of 124 million outpatient appointments last year, 8 million were no-shows. Do not attend, as they're called DNAs, are more common among those with higher deprivation scores. So think travel costs. Messaging patients 14 days before an appointment and a follow-up four days before has been shown to really work. Separate out diagnostic from treatment, create two lists and then break them down into type. Publish the lot and celebrate success, however small. Focus on the total patient pathway. But look for bottlenecks, patient transport, test turnaround times, internal comms. Look at door to clinic and home again through the eyes of a patient. Plot the volume of referrals by the types of patient and look for daily, weekly and monthly patterns. Understand the resources required by one type of patient for their pathway, creating a process template, and measure this in consistent units of time, and then pour similar work 
and share staff resources. Avoid queue jumping, work in time order. This reduces the overall waiting time. Look at the difference in waiting times between the decision to admit and the date for treatment. Use this to discuss practice and process. Avoid patients having to come to hospital on different days for different tests. And ask your people, how can I make your job easier? Every minute of every delay adds up to hours and days. Well, how do I know all this? Well, no, it's not me. I just read a very smart little booklet written by some very smart people. It's called Seven Ways to Know Delays. Now, it's 10 years old, this book, and it is still as valid as the day it was written. No reorganisation required, just the time and space to relentlessly focus on the detail. Thanks for listening. I hope you have a good week and I look forward to speaking.